Uh, outline looks familiar, but it's actually different. It should be part D. So uh, working on the two great commands of loving God and loving others. And uh, we're going to hopefully um, finish off other centeredness and uh, also cover valuing the right things today. Uh, last week I was asked, uh, how do you know if you're being self-centered? And I had been contemplating putting together a little checklist. Because as I looked it up, there were always all these kind of checklists. And uh, I have kind of done that, combining a number of thoughts, which i uh, hopefully elaborate on. Uh, for those of you who have really bad memories, so the first command was love God first. <laughs> and the second one is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus upped it, love your neighbor as he loved us. Which means you need to lay down your life for it. If you're not loving God first, you will not love others correctly. And uh, loving others is not just taking your ideas of relationship that come out of a non-Christian, pagan, non-spirit-led mindset and just say, oh, well, that's what I'm supposed to do to others. Because if you do that, you wind up committing idolatry, loving others more than God, and you know, you're not really accomplishing God's purposes in the lives of others. You're not being very Christ-like. Um, and it's really important that you first be loving God. A particular point under up being other-centered is that you have to obey God first. So up top, loving God, the component up there is you can't have a relationship with God apart from total obedience to His will. If you are not obeying God, you don't know God. Um, and if you are obeying Him, there's a good chance you have a good relationship with Him. So uh, that has to come first. And what that does is it trains your will to not indulge your natural desires and instincts. Um, there's this thing that scripture is called the natural man. It's a person who's basically just like an animal, and it's just what most of the world is. They are devoid of the spirit, the spirit of God is not controlling them, their desires and instincts are. So in order to obey God, we have to learn how to say no to the desires that we have, and yes to the desires that God has for us. Otherwise we will never experience God's blessings. Satan might bless us, but God won't be blessing us. It, the parallel is with children. As you raise them, you have to teach them first to obey the parent so they can then eventually obey God. Um, the parent teaches the children not to live like you know, little wild things, but to restrain their impulses to either you know, kill their siblings or take whatever they see. And then they learn the concept of self-control. Because in order to obey God, particularly when he calls you to do things that naturally you would not want to do, like die to self, you uh, have the training to be able to say no to your natural impulses. Now, a lot of kids don't get that growing up, so um, usually the schooling system provides some level of socialization. What that basically means is you don't run around like a wild beast. It's kind of a good thing. <laughs> so then when you actually, the benefit of a higher education is not the stuff they teach you contrary to popular opinion, speaking as a professor of higher education, it's basically learning how to buckle down, figure out what's required, and do it. The content is almost irrelevant, and you know, people change careers and content of what they have to do for their job multiple times in a life. It's, so it's that basic skill of being able to figure out what's supposed to be done, and then harnessing your energies to actually make it happen is the benefit of an education. And uh, some of my students have never quite get it, but they might get it on their job, but from what I read about employers complaining about the millennial generation, a lot of them haven't. <laughs> and if any of you have supervised people that are just like out of college, you kind of recognize they don't quite get it. And uh, you know, eventually the workplace gets them into that line, but it's a, it's a battle frequently. So obeying God enables you to restrain your own desires so you can focus on others being other-centered. And we've looked at this for a couple of weeks, I previewed it, spent all last week on it, and uh, I, in light of the request for it, uh, I'm going to do this little quiz and also tell you how to correct any deficiencies that you might see in your life. That's the purpose of you know, teaching, is to try to help you bring your life into conformity with God's Word. It's, you know, it's what Jesus said, the Great Commission is go make disciples, teaching them to obey. Paul, as an apostle, wanted to bring about the obedience that should accompany your faith. Uh, Book of Romans, beginning and end. A little tidbit for those of you who are going to be studying Romans. So under uh, number seven on your list, um, last week I asked the question, why are we self-centered? 
And basically because we got this hole in our soul, our needs are not being met by God. So we look to others to meet them. We look, do all kinds of things to get attention from others, uh, to get uh, some affection or just acknowledgement because we, we really have this vacuum that uh, is not being met by our current situation. And as Pascal said, it's a God-shaped vacuum in every man's heart that can only be met by God. So we try to use others, it's a futile task. So I, I've observed the lives of a number of people uh, over the course of my existence. Um, I saw it in my p parents and their peers, and I, I see it in my generation, I see it in the younger generation, where people go through friends, they, they, they constantly cycle through friends, trying to find someone that they think, oh, this will work. And I, I'm amazed as I grew up, I noticed my parents had like their bridge group and their chess group and you know, their, their New Year's group and their party group. And they, they just cycle through various sets of friends. And uh, at the end of the life, my mom has a totally new group of friends. <laughs> you know, and they, they still aren't meeting the needs that she had because like a typical human, um, she wasn't doing the things that enabled God to meet her needs. So she's always looking for other people to meet their needs. Uh, the reason your needs aren't met by God is because we're frequently half-hearted in self-denial. We say, oh yeah, well, I kind of won't do the stuff that you know I find uncomfortable, uh, but we don't really go to the full way of self-crucifixion, which we're going to talk about in a minute or two, and embrace God's purpose for life. Um, and the others I talked about uh, last week. So let's look under 7a. Here's the first thing to figure out if you are self-centered or not. Okay, are you self-centered, selfish, same deal. Okay, egocentric, the world revolves around you. Um, you're your you know, own little god of your own little universe, which actually is quite small compared to the real god in his universe. Okay, if you haven't made a deliberate decision to deny yourself and crucify your flesh, you are, by default, selfish. Ta-da, there it is. So you wanna know you're selfish? Yes, the answer is yes, we all are. We start out this way, okay? The goal is to become less selfish, all right? So in Philippians 2, we had the great example of Jesus leaving the comforts and joys and delights of heaven to come down to earth, to spend time trying to instruct the 12 dummies, to spend time getting spat on and whipped and crucified by the very people he loved and created. You know, it's like, why would you do that? Why? And it's not just because he was so overwhelmed at how wonderful he felt towards us that he had to do this. No, he's working out some bigger plan, the glorification of God the Father, according to Ephesians 1, it tells you about all those things. So much of you know, people's approach to the Bible is man-centered. It's all about you, 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 you. No, it's really about God, 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 and what we are supposed to do for God. So uh, the, the thing that motivated Jesus to sacrifice himself for the benefit of others was to please the Father and he got the name above all other names, according to Philippians 2. That should be motivating to us as well. So let's look again at number 7a. This is a tough one. Uh, pay attention to it. Your flesh is going to say, no, you don't want to pay attention to this. If you haven't made a deliberate decision, that means you need to make a deliberate decision. A decision. Deliberate. Okay, everybody got deliberate decision? Any questions on deliberate decision? Okay, good. The thing that you have to do is deny yourself. Now, when Jesus called people to follow him, the first thing he said is, you need to deny yourself. Not deny chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> Not deny, you know, toasted marshmallow, sundae, fudge, whatever. Deny your very being, the right to yourself. You, you give up ownership to yourself. You say, hey, I'm not, I don't live for me. I live for something else. I live for God. And the next piece is to crucify yourself. We're going to talk about self-crucifixion. Very, very difficult. Um, if you think about it, you know, it's like, okay, you get one hand nailed down. Like, yeah, <laughs> how do you get... Wait a minute, you know, it's like... <laughs> it's an <coughs> extremely difficult thing <coughs> to do. God will help you if you are willing and desire it. We'll talk about that in one minute. Um, you crucify your flesh, which is the desire for the temporal. <coughs> and then you have hope of not being self-centered and selfish. Paul says in Galatians 5.24, this is right after the fruits of the flesh and the fruits of the spirit. <clears throat> the very next verse after the fruits of the spirit is, 
those who are Christ, who have a close relationship to Christ, who are uh, you know, loved and owned by him, who are, who are in union with him, have crucified, past tense, they've done it, the flesh, with its passions and desires. Luke 9, 23, Jesus said, you have to deny yourself if you're going to follow me. Romans 12, 1 and 2, you need to present yourself as an ongoing sacrifice. There's death and pain here, folks. Think about it. These are not cuddly, cute terms. Denial is hard, but crucifixion is ugly, it's brutal, it's painful. So, how do you actually crucify yourself? Um, how do you put something to death? Well, when you have a desire, if you look at that desire from God's perspective, you realize that it is deadly and harmful and it's going to hurt you both in the short term and long term and you have developed an aversion to it and you never go back to it. Now, a lot of people, some people said I've overused this illustration, but it's, it's so applicable, is my former love affair with green peppers. I used to like them, but then when I realized what they did to me, it extinguished my desire. And I have no more a desire for them. I did a similar thing with New York Super Chunk Budge ice cream. I saw that, I realized what it did to my cholesterol level, I realized I was killing myself, and I this stopped. And it's just, whenever the opportunity came up to engage my emotions in that desire, I said, no, stop. And this is back before I discovered how you can blow up ideas in your mind and kind of extinguish desires and you know, stuff like that. But deadly desires will kill us unless we kill them first. So you need to go through this process of crucifying yourself. It does not just come with singing a song, which we frequently sing, saying, take my life and let it be consecrated to you, which is good and it's true and that should be the way. But if it doesn't have any carry over into our lives, I think we become hypocrites. Because we sing this song and we don't really mean it. And I, I'm thinking, probably we do more harm than good because you know, God said every word we speak, if we're saying these things, He's kind of basically revealing them in the future. So we really want the songs that we sing to be a reflection of our hearts. And uh, I have trouble with most songs because there are lines in there that don't really fit my understanding of the scripture, so I just kind of mumble through that part. <laughs> but, uh, but I mumble in tune as much as I can. So um, you have to have made a decision to deny yourself. Basically you say, God, I take all the things in life that charm me most and I sacrifice them to you. All my dreams, all my aspirations, all that I want, um, I don't really care if I get that or not unless you give it to me. I remember a point when I was in college where uh, I think I was on my second suspension and I think I was like the last one and uh, I had to stay in school in order to keep my scholarship and I you know, would get on the dean's list of people that they wanted to honor. The next semester I'd be on the dean's list of people they wanted to kick out and I was on one of these last ones and um, I remember just getting a notification that, uh, sorry, uh, you know, we are um, asking you to leave and I thought, oh no, what am I going to do? I really blew it this time and I did. Yeah, I goofed off. And uh, I said, okay God, uh, my dreams, my aspirations, whatever, um, my ideas of my future, uh, I don't have them anymore. Whatever, whatever you want, that's what I'll do. doesn't matter what, that's what I'm going to do. And if you see fit to somehow miraculously make it so I can stay in school, um, that's great. But if not, all right, it's your way, no longer my way. So I remember that afternoon I was visiting a beautiful falls, they call them buttermilk falls because the falls are all you know, well, kind of frothy like buttermilk. And everybody's there having a good time and you know, outwardly I was having a good time but inside I was like, I'm dying. But uh, so that night I went to work, I, I was near, uh, during the hotel school, I was a bartender and uh, I'm tending bar and uh, the guy comes up to me and uh, develops a conversation and he said, I've been watching you. Oh, <laughs> you know, I, I know I was about reproach because I wasn't an idiot. I might have been stupid, but I wasn't an idiot. <laughs> and uh, so I'm thinking, what's going on? And he said, um, what are your plans for your future? And I said, uh, I, I don't really know. I thought I was going to do this, but, you know, uh, I'm not, I, I'm not sure it's going to work out. 
and he said, do you want to enter his hotel school, which is the toughest school at Cornell to get into. I had to have anything working there through a friend. And uh, it, I said, well, yeah, because I had no other options. Now, the hoteliers were the people that everyone else in the school used to make fun of because they you know, weren't the brightest candles in the box. They made more money than anybody else getting out. You know, students don't realize that because it was like an undergraduate business degree. Um, and uh, the guy said, my name is Professor Christian, and I basically knew that he was the number two guy in the school. What he said went, um, I will back you getting into the school. Kind of really funny. You know, he, he is totally unchristian in every aspect of his life. He's the, you know, he's the devil incarnate for most people's view. <laughs> but God used him to rescue me for my stupidity. And uh, he sponsored me to get in. I got in. I, and I kept, you know, actually graduated in the honor society. Yeah, duh. <laughs> you know, because at that point, guy kind of gave me the extra nudges and discipline. Plus, the work was easy. Um, <laughs> and I was able to uh, you know, live happily ever after as a result. Not because of the education I got, but because of the decision I made that, God, it's your way. Now, historically, um, you know, Christianity, I, I kind of look back thinking as I read church history, how do these people survive? They really aren't understanding what the scripture says, but they understand one thing. Jesus died for your sins, and you're supposed to die to yourself to follow him. So most churches that have survived throughout history have been ones that call people to deny themselves, to commit themselves to Jesus. People don't even know what they're committing themselves to, but they make a commitment to go for, towards Jesus, and other things in life start falling into place. If you don't make that commitment, you are basically still selfish. Selfish people have no relationship with God and no relationship with others. They lose doubly. All right, so you really need to make that decision deliberately. If you cannot point to a time in your life by this time next week, be able to point to a time in your life when you said, God, it's no longer about me, it's all about you. I have crucified my flesh with its passions and desires and ambitions. They're gone, and I live now for you. And then you do the Romans 12, 1 and 2. Actually, that's Romans 12, 1. It's yield yourself, put yourself on the altar and let God kind of basically rip out the old heart and give you a new one, and then be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It starts with an act of the will to make it happen. Okay, so that's the first thing. If you haven't made that decision, guess what? You're still living for yourself. And by definition, that's self-centered. Now, part two, second one, B. If you think or care about what you would like rather than what God likes, you're self-centered. If you think or care about and make your decisions based upon what you would like rather than what God would like or what would benefit others, you're self-centered. You can read this a number of ways. It's all the same thing. It's basically when it comes down to what do you think about? What are your aspirations? What are your dreams? What do you want? If it's about what you want rather than what God wants, ta-da! Guess what? You just racked up another point for being self-centered. Okay? So, we're told, in the verse I looked at a couple weeks ago, don't look out for your own interests. Romans, uh, right number 7, Philippians 2, 3, do nothing with selfish ambition or pursuit of glory for yourself, but in humility you look out for the interest of others. So, think about what occupies your time. What will I wear? What will I look like? What will others think about me? How can I get my next promotion? You know, how, how do I get more of this or that? If that's what's occupying your time, then you're self-centered. If you're thinking about what will please yourself versus what will please God, you're self-centered. Okay, all well, that fits under that category. Yeah. So going back to A, you say either you live for yourself or live for God. Can you have half and half like you live half your life for yourself? Um, you can possibly do that, but if there's, if you have half the life for yourself and half the life for God, the fact that you can have half your life for yourself means you haven't crucified yourself. Does that make sense? <laughs> because if, if you put to death yourself, yourself, how do you still have those desires? So, really, it looks in practice like you're doing half for God, but you might want to re-examine. If you're doing this stuff for yourself, then you are doing this stuff for God. Now, if you've made the decision to do that, okay, you can be... In fact, we all are imperfect in your pursuit of doing things for God. Does that make sense? So you want to do what's right, but 
it's just that you, you spent all these years learning how to be a really good sinner, so, you know, it's a shame that let all that talent go to waste. <laughs> so you kind of let that play a little bit until you can kind of uh, start, you know, putting it to death, sanctifying yourself. Okay, so that's, it's not really an either or. Yeah. I have a follow-up question. So sure. you make that decision where you're saying, like, all on the altar, but then you still have to then go back and root out those desires, right? Because they'll... Each, each individual desire it doesn't always like it's not extinguished in that one moment. Right. It's an everyday decision, an ongoing sacrifice, daily decision to plunge the truth of, right into the heart. Jesus said, "Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily." So you make the once and for all decision, but it's not once and for all. <laughs> it's once every day for all time. And then you're transformed by the renewing of your mind, and that renewing of your mind can sometimes take effort. But then as soon as you're brought to the awareness of, oh, I'm thinking about myself more than God, you need to change that. I'm thinking about myself more than others. Oh, God, help me. Living selfishly is sin, people. You know, it's like, <laughs> we tend not to think that. Oh, well, yeah, who isn't selfish? Yeah, well, we're all selfish because we all sin. That doesn't make sin good. Sin is deadly. And the more we do of it, the worse our life will be, both now and in the future. So if you think more about your desires, based on what you would like rather than what God would like, then that's another point for being selfish. Here's a one that's, uh, you can actually keep track of this. You get more than you give. Um, there's a thing that I remember reading once upon a time, that when you're driving, if uh, you pass more cars than pass you, you're speedy. Right? So if you get in the left lane and just go and nobody passes you, you'll eventually find out that you're speeding and you get tickets. Right? Your insurance rates go up and you know, it gets prohibitively expensive to drive. If you are basically getting more uh, attention, appreciation, affirmation, uh, people listen to you more than you listen to them, you get more compliments than you give, uh, people serve you rather than you serving them. Uh, if others are the ones that have to compromise and you don't compromise, then you're basically selfish. That makes sense? So, you know, there's some balance. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the things that, you know, you, you always have to have your way. Um, I left that specifically out because people confuse when they talk about compromise. They think, oh, well, sometimes it's what you want, sometimes it's what I want. And in natural relationships, that's correct. But since we have truth, remember, compromise is about both people moving toward what's right. So if one person is right and the other person is wrong, the person who's wrong has to move towards what's right. The person who is right does not move to the people who are wrong. That's not compromise, that's sin. Because they're departing from what they know is right. So you can think about in your relationships, how much attention, appreciation, affirmation, listening, compliments do you give to other people? We crave them for ourselves, do we give them to others? I mean, if you want to follow the golden rule, hey, if you want to get others to compliment you, compliment them. And then the sad thing is you see people trying to do this on a purely secular thing. Oh, I'm supposed to do compliment now. Oh, my, that's a nice uh, pair of socks you're wearing. I didn't even notice them. They just blended right in. Great pair of socks. You know, it's like, <laughs> right. <laughs> there, I did a compliment. Uh, there was a Yankee, I believe, um, A-Rod, I think, yeah, Alex Rodriguez, who um, had trouble fitting in with the team. And uh, I think Joe Torre, the manager, took him aside and said, you know, you basically want to have your own assistant to get you coffee in the clubhouse. And the whole rest of the team shares four assistants. But you want your own assistant just for you. And that's kind of causing problems with your teammates because you're not being a good team player. Because you want to get more attention and more things your way than those others. So why don't you try getting your own coffee, okay? So, so Tori, thinks, I mean, uh, I think it's A-Rod thinks about this, and if it's not A-Rod, I'm sorry, A-Rod, I, you know, I think it was you. Um, 
goes and gets his own coffee and then goes in to tell the coach, I got my own coffee. It's like, great. <laughs> great, it's progress. But, you know, <laughs> hey, guys, I got my own coffee. I'm not self-centered, see? You know, it's like, <laughs> and people are like that. They, they, they so want to be known, like, oh, yeah, see, I, I, I did something that was other-centered. Aren't, aren't I wonderful? You know? It, no, you just don't get it. <laughs> a person who has not died to self is going to still crave this because they're not getting God's approval. So you, you basically want to have some thought of, uh, is there reciprocity? Are you giving more to others? Otherwise, it's unjust, and God hates injustice. Think about that. It's unjust. If you take from people and you don't give back. What's that called? Selfish? Unjust? Non-Christ-like? And in my book, Not Good. Corollary to this is ingratitude. I talked about narcissism last week. Uh, you know, you just are so enraptured with yourself that you can't look or see anybody else's needs. And a, a trait of these people that kept showing up on these sample quizzes was ingratitude because you don't recognize the fact that others have um, contributed to your growth and success and you're not grateful to it, you think that you've gotten better and more sociable and civilized because you're just so wonderful. <laughs> not realizing that God has been at the Word Network trying to perfect you through others laying down their life for you. And uh, then if they have done that, you obviously need to go give to others as well. D, you're unable to empathize with others thinking that everyone views life and feels like you do. So the ability to go into someone else's shoes. Um, someone said, before you criticize anyone, you should always walk a mile in their moccasins. That way, when you criticize them, you're a while away from them and you got their shoes. <laughs> um, the idea is understand what the other person is going through having empathy, but I, I've noticed with some people uh, that they think that their way is the only way because they can't view things from an other's perspective. Ends possibly have a little easier time in this. Uh, if you're a censor, you might be falling into this because you, you have your way of viewing life. And the fact that there are other ways of viewing it outside, that's 75% of the population, outside your, your way of viewing it, there might be something else. And, uh, you know, people come into Christianity basically becoming aware of something that was outside their initial frame of reference. That pattern should continue to be aware that there's other ways of looking at things. And uh, stop condemning others because they don't feel like you do or view life like you do. Uh, corollary to this one is people will basically disclose how they're feeling with the wrong purpose. They either give too little information or too much information. Um, was it TMI, too much information? <laughs> it, it, it's not a lot, it usually has a certain connotation. But a lot of people do that, they just feel like, I've got to get it off my chest. But that's not purposeful speech, that's self-centered speech. When we did some of the stuff on speech, your speech and disclosure of yourself to others needs to be purposeful. How does this benefit them? How does it glorify God? Now, there's some times when you need to disclose more than you're comfortable disclosing so things can be seen in their proper light. Other times, you keep your mouth shut. So, how are you supposed to do this? Well, Ephesians 4 says, uh, let your speech always be with grace, season with salt, that you might, and not corrupt, that you might minister grace to the hearers. The goal is to minister grace to the hearers. The goal is not to get it off your chest. The goal is not to blurt out whatever you're feeling. The goal is not to say, oh, I just got to say this. No. It's does the Spirit of God want you to say it or not? If the Spirit of God is at work in you, He is trying to you know, prompt you to do and say what God wants, and you need to be receptive to Him. However, if you have grieved Him or quenched Him through your disobedience or bad relationships with other members of the body, those are the two contexts of where grief and quench come in, then you're just going to basically blurt out whatever you want, and uh, that actually usually causes damage. E is you use others to meet your needs for friendship, companionship, excitement, even wisdom. You, you, you basically use others, and 
you're not, you know, basically valuing or investing in them or in the relationship. Or on another side of this, you only reach out in terms of ministry to the fun or beautiful people. You know, you only want to help others when it's neat and easy and you, fun. You don't want to deal with the mess. Lives are messy. And we need to be willing to enter into the lives of each other and other people to minister to them, to help them become all that Christ wants them to be. Any questions on those two or three? When things are messy, you don't tell that person to stop Well, okay, the question is, when things are messy, you don't tell the person to stop disclosing? It, it depends on the context and the purpose. What's the purpose of the disclosure? Oh, I just need to vent. No, no, that's not good. Um, Self-control and spirit control are fruits of the spirit. They're supposed to reign. So, yeah, there are people who are damaged, and they don't have... Um, there's times for them to just, you know let it all hang out. But that's usually not the way that mature believers work. Mature believers are under the control of the Spirit and purposeful in what they do and say. So being a listening ear to someone, good idea. Encouraging them to explore deeper, because some people um, don't actually think um, unless they verbalize. And when they verbalize, then you know better things come out. So. That's why God has this thing called the body, where there's safety, security, and people can verbalize what they're thinking. And it's not so we just always accept it. We accept it, and then we recognize, okay, there's things here that are not in accord with the truth. Now I need to figure out, what is God's plan for dealing with these needs? Now, like, oh, well, that's not what the Bible says. <laughs> Which occasionally could be useful, but that's usually not the good idea. God has, just like he controls your speech and other things, he controls your speech in ministering to others. You need to be prayerful about what does God want you to say? What's going to accomplish his purposes? And you need to discern what are God's purposes in this person's life? What is God trying to do? If that's not entering into your thinking, then your speech is self-centered. Because it's just about what you come up with as opposed to what the Spirit of God comes up with. And I'm always gratified in the praise time when I hear how God is directing and ministering to people through his word because that's going to be equipping them to better minister to others. That should be your experience, that God guides you and directs you. That was E. Let's look at F. Um, you're lazy except when you're gratifying your own desires. You only make sacrifices to benefit yourself. These two came out of a thing in terms of marriage relationships. And uh, you, know, you basically, you look at what people get excited about. And if they only get excited about the stuff they like, the stuff that feeds their flesh, you're dealing with a selfish, self-centered person. If they are excited about the things that please God and making heroic sacrifices, I mean, you read Paul, the guy's a hero. I mean, he's just an incredible, self-sacrificial person. Yeah, you know, we think, well, Jesus, well, that's his job. But, you know... <laughs> Paul and the disciples and the early martyrs who got killed for trying to minister to others, um, they are excited about doing things that benefit others more than they are about themselves. Uh, Jill passed along a story of a couple of believers, I believe, in Damascus, uh, three gals or so. And uh, it's, Damascus is not a nice place to visit. You know, any vacation plans to Damascus, you know, just you know, places of war zone. If you're a Christian in Damascus, like, hide. And if you are a Christian woman in Damascus, get out of town, because it is just not really good. But there are three Christian women in Damascus who basically drive around to minister to people. And uh, there was a, someone who was in the hospital, they went to go pray with the person, and uh, they would pray that God would surround them and protect them. That is Psalm 91. And uh, they're going to the hospital, they hear, you know, there's always rifle fire, but there was a rifle or a gunshot that uh, hit their car. And then they expected it to blow up, but it didn't. And then the car still worked. 
So they kept driving to get out of that spot. When they got to the hospital, they looked around. The car seemed to be okay. They went in and prayed with the woman, and they drove home. And there was another Christian guy, this a military guy, who uh, came over and checked out their car and found out that a bullet went through the engine. The bullet didn't damage any of the engine. The bullet came right to the dashboard, right by the steering wheel, and stopped. Had it continued another two feet, it would have gone through the heart of the driver. And the bullet was turned up. So the bullet comes in this way, boom, gets turned up. And it's like an angel or God just went, stop, and the bullet, Rrr. God protects his people as they do the things that please him. These ladies obviously were not taking a joy ride through Damascus. <laughs> I mean, it could be some valley girls, that, wow, hey, let's go for a ride. <laughs> They're really fun. I mean, it's really exciting out there. No. These are there seeking to please. They're not gratifying their own desires. Whenever I see the concept of not making sacrifices that only benefit for yourself, uh, I don't want to say anything against those of you who run, but people who do the running thing, um, are making sacrifices that are subduing their flesh. Because your flesh basically does not want to go do that unless you get into the endorphin high kick and then you know people continue to exercise even though it you know, ruins all their joints because oh, I feel so good when I do it, I can't live without it. You know, they're, they're, they're addicted to it. And uh, they are able to make sacrifices that um, benefit themselves in a spiritual, I mean a physical realm, but they often don't do the same thing in, in the uh, uh, spiritual realm. And there's a verse coming up on that. Um, the second part of F is, others have to nag or exhort you to do what you should. If you have to be told to do what you should, you, you should basically be ashamed of yourself because you're supposed to figure that out. <laughs> right? So like my job, I, I shouldn't even have to do this because you, know, you guys should just look at the scriptures and get it. <laughs> But if, if I have to um, tell you, okay, great, maybe you didn't know. And, and then when you're in relationships and you are, quote, struggling with something, you know, struggle's all right as long as you're making progress. But th there's something wrong in a relationship where if there's something you're supposed to be doing and you don't do it and it gets to the point where other people that live with you have to nag you to do it, then there's something wrong. Um, I purpose when I was uh, got married, I realized that you know nagging is not a good thing, so I wouldn't nag Jill. No. <laughs> I also purposed not to be naggable, um, so I made sure that what I was doing was not geared towards me; it was geared towards our principles and objectives and stuff like that. I'm not perfect in it, but uh, if others have to basically put pressure on you to do what you should be doing anyway, it's because God isn't getting through to you because you're not sensitive to him. Um, any questions on that one? So give yourself a point if you are doing either of those. Give yourself two points if you're doing both. And, <laughs> you know, a maximum of like 15 points on this part. Uh, and then withdrawing or angry or passive aggressive when things don't go as you wish. What's your response to disappointment? <laughs> you know, do you grumble and fuss at God? Um, you know, one of Jill's favorite verses with the kids growing up and now that she has a husband it's home uh, is <laughs> uh, mustn't grumble. You know, we, we picked this up with some British woman uh, who someone's asked how they, how they went and she said, mustn't grumble. It's quite, quite, quite right. It's a problem. Yeah. <clears throat> mustn't grumble. So uh, my big response to this, I'm not grumbling, I'm fussing. You know, <laughs> I mean, there's, is there a verse in the Bible against fussing? I mean, grumbling's bad. Israel grumbled, they got killed in the wilderness. But fussing, come on. You know. <laughs> and, and just for the record, I know that grumbling and fussing are both the same thing. And they're not good. <laughs> but when people don't get things when they go the way they want, um, they, they tend to do two things, and they're flip sides of a passive-aggressive personality. If they withdraw and kind of, oh, it's going to be miserable, and they curl up into a ball and suck their thumb, then, you know, that, that's a self-centered thing because they think that everything in life depends upon them getting this one thing. And, and the flip side, uh, and you see both of these in some people, is they get aggressive when things don't go as they wish. So it's called a passive-aggressive. It's a personality disorder, just like narcissism is a personality disorder. The fact that we can put a name on it from a medical journal does not mean that it's acceptable. 
It's called selfish sin, and that's what's going on there. Um, the correct thing would be to see and achieve God's purposes in the difficult situations. I don't think we really appreciate um, the fact that God orchestrates all the events of our world. Like, I'm a huge believer in the sovereign conductor of the universe. <laughs> he puts all the notes together, brings them in at just the right time. It's, it's like he's using all the colors to weave the tapestry. He pulls all those things together. And when we see something we don't like, we want to tend to, to you know, get rid of it. And we get withdrawing or we get angry as opposed to recognizing that God has purposes to bless us. Why do we always think when we can't have something we want that God hates us? Because Satan is whispering that in our ear, just like he did with Eve. He's been doing it for you know, thousands and thousands of years. So if things don't go your way and you can't basically count it all joy, like James says, there's something wrong. Count it all joy when you experience various trials. Why? Because you're supposed to always have a happy face? No, because you know that this is actually for your benefit. You know that God works these things together for good if you love Him. That's why it's so important that you love God first, because then all this other stuff would fall into place. And if you don't love God first, this other stuff won't fall into place. So when bad things happen, you think it's God trying to be mean to you, not recognizing that He's really trying to bless you. I love the book of Amos for a particular thing. It's um, got the second section of it is mixed mercy. God sends increasing discipline to the nation of Israel. Starts out at a low level and then raises it. Why? To get them to a spot where he can bless them. And he basically says for the prophets, I can't bless you where you guys are. You need to be doing what I said so I can bless you. Because I said you have to do this in order to get blessed. And God's not going to go back on his word. So if you tend to basically view the circumstances of your life as the things that determine your happiness or unhappiness, then you're just viewing life from your perspective, not God's perspective. And my creative God can do all things to um, you know, work them all together for good. Okay, any question on that one? Yeah. The psalmist obviously had emotions and went to God with the emotions. So where's the sort of balance between appropriate processing and then less important? Okay, where's the psalmist went to God with the, his emotions when things didn't go very well? Where's the balance between appropriate processing with God versus the idea of mustn't grumble? Oh, where's the idea between the balance between appropriate processing with God and mustn't grumble? Um, the Lord Jesus in the garden poured out his heart to God. And then processed it, and by the end of the story, bring on the crucifiers. Almost every psalm, some of the psalms are actually split incorrectly. Um, some of them went together in the original Hebrew and they got split up. But just about every psalm has a resolution. I went to God, I poured out my complaint, and then God communicated back because the psalmist had a good relationship with God. You always go to God and be honest with how you're feeling, and then give God a chance to talk. <laughs> a lot of times, we pour out our complaint to God and then we leave. Like, God, do you have anything to say about this? So if you look at the Psalms, I, I, you know, it's like what I've been doing recently is in the morning when I'm trying to get my coffee into my system, I'll, I'll you hit the end Bible. Is it the end Bible? No, you version. And it'll be, it reads to me, and I, you know, I, like, I can repeat the Psalms again and again. And I'm always struck how, first of all, how much difficulty God had in David's life. Even though David was the anointed king, and, uh, and the, the, you know, basically uh, first in line of the Davidic covenant. So, number one, he got led all these difficulties, and David always went to God. And, you know, it's just like in the 9 through 15 or so, and uh, he purposed that he would not transgress. But a little later, he says, like, all these enemies, God's going to get them. And, and there was one, somewhere between 9 and 15, it's been 10 to 14, where David describes how his enemies are going to be totally annihilated. And I mentioned to Jill, I said, you know, 
that wouldn't sell in Christianity today. Because <laughs> our conception of Christianity isn't really biblical. And we think, oh, it's okay that they were really horrible and everything. It's fine. But David, if you look at how David, the man after on God's own heart, responded to that. By the end of almost every psalm, he has processed it and said, okay, now I can go. So where's the balance? Call out to God. But then at the end, it's processed. And it should be before you get off your knees or leave his presence that you have his perspective on things where you can trust God to say, yeah, God, I really don't like this. Yeah, you know, I'm sure you don't like it either, but you allowed it for good, and I know you will make it up to me. It's like Job saying, I know whom I have believed. Paul said the same thing. And I know that I'm going to stand on the earth in victory in the last day, or that God has laid up a crown of righteousness for me, Job and Paul. Okay, great. All right, so now we got three little things uh, that are the positive, the corrective, um, you need to purpose, plan, and prepare. Those are three different things. You, you purpose that you're going to love and serve others. Then you plan how you're going to do that. And then you prepare to get yourself in shape to do it. Right? It's like a yeah, basic approach to a job. I'm going to do this. This is how I'm going to do it. And then I need to actually I take the little steps to make, their, make it happen. I think we're going to be talking about that in notification times. So you purpose, plan, and prepare. If you've never purposed, good time to do it. Go to the toil stuff about your purpose for your life and you know, your different relationships and ministry and uh, figure out your own one there. Then work out a plan. How are you going to love others? It's one of the questions on the final exam of life. And then you prepare to actually make it happen. And then you do it. So you want to love and serve others. Uh, the body. We talked about the body last week. Really important in God's economy. And then there's this ministry part where you adapt your plan based upon how the other person responds and how they reveal deeper needs. So a lot of people say, okay, I'm going to go and minister. But then it doesn't go like it's supposed to and you keep pushing for it. And you need to really still be other-centered in thinking about, okay, they're not responding. What do I need to do? What are God's purposes in this person's life? How can I help them get to where God wants them to go? Do, do I need to do something differently? And, and one of my mantras that go underneath this is that the right answer is the right answer even if they don't accept it. So you need to figure out a different way to get them to the right answer. But what happens almost universally is when people are having difficulty, they have rejected the right answer. So what we do is we try to come up with all other answers. And you know, God basically gives one major answer to the thing, self-denial, trusting Jesus. So you need to help figure out a different way to get people to that point. Um, so if they reject it, then you just need to figure out another way to help them try to accept it. Um, I, oh yeah, this one's kind of cute. Uh, those who are spiritually stretched develop a spiritual sensitivity and a flexibility that allows them to serve without hurting themselves. Okay, so like I turned 60 this year. And uh, we were talking to some of the gals about a, their doctor who uh, climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. And uh, he used a rowing machine. And uh, because it was one of the ones that kind of gave him the best aerobic workout without doing much damage to the joints. And I'm realizing, you know, in 40 I started really getting joint problems. In 50 I worked on getting myself in shape but encountered joint problems that are still with me a decade later. So, uh, you know, I, I went, was looking for the thing of uh, how do we figure out how to, uh, you know, basically not go to seed in the final years uh, without doing damage to joints. So uh, I'm researching all this stuff, and uh, I, I came across a lot of people in their 40s saying, yeah, once I turned 40, I had to stop using weights because it kept ruining my joints. And I realized, yeah, whenever I tried to lift up a weight, <laughs> at a certain point, it's like, ah, I'm not going to do that for another week. So uh, we came across this thing, it's like a total gym. You get these things for like a hundred bucks, a clone of them. You use your own body weight, and it's almost impossible to damage yourself on it. You know, the thing came in, and we're playing on it, and uh, it, it's actually good. I started stretching things that I didn't know I had. Um, <laughs> and I, I know doing my research that it's really important when you get to be old and crotchety and decrepit, like yours truly, that you stretch so you don't do more damage than not. All right, so um, I'm stretching other things. And with the flexibility, once you're kind of thing, then you can actually do things without getting damaged, okay? The same analogy carries over into your spiritual life. In the objective of trying to prepare yourself to serve others, God will stretch you. 
He will put you in difficult circumstances. He will call upon muscles that you didn't know you had. <laughs> and uh, th they get sore if you first use them. If, but then once you kind of get through that process, you develop a spiritual sensitivity to God as God has met your, met your needs so you can then meet the needs of others. Thessalonians talks about that, right? It says that we are able to comfort others with the comfort that we received. That's the goal. God doesn't comfort us just so we can be fat, dumb, and happy. He comforts us so we can be lean, mean machines working for Him. That's the objective. Okay, I'll, I'll leave the athletic metaphors aside for a few minutes. But that's, that's the idea. Now I'm coming up, I have another one coming up. That as we are spiritually stretched, outside our comfort zone, we develop a sensitivity to God and His purposes in our life, which gives us the basis of having a sensitivity to God's purposes in others' life, which makes us flexible and adaptable in trying to meet their needs. If plan A doesn't work, we come up with a plan B that still gets us the objective of plan A. And then we can serve without being disappointed when we get rejected. We can serve without doing damage to others because, we're, well, it's going to be some damage because they're not going to, sometimes they don't want to give up their um, sin easily and they're going to feel like they're hurt. But basically, you can serve in such a way that you're more effective if you have basically been spiritually stretched yourself. Any questions on that one? J. Train yourself to be godly. If you haven't done that, give yourself a point on self-centeredness. Because <laughs> you don't really care about being godly. Um, train yourself to be godly. If you don't know what godly is, give yourself another point. <laughs> Titus was written, to, Paul said, I'm an apostle to bring about godliness. And godliness is the state of knowing and doing what the gods desired. So if you only care about what you want, not what care what God wants, is where we started on this, then you're self-centered. But if you're training yourself to be godly so you can help and disciple others, you're doing good. You can actually give yourself a minus point, <laughs> make up for the previous ones. Uh, you want to make sure your knowledge is biblical so that what you're saying is what God would say. Speaking truth. Right? How do you get to speak truth? You need to learn the truth. Live the truth. Love others with the truth. If we try to love others with our conception of the truth without having gone through those first two steps, we're basically going to do damage. We're going to be bogus. Uh, we're going to actually wind up getting judged for uh, basically accomplishing Satan's purposes rather than God's purposes. Train yourself to be godly. Make sure that what you're saying is biblical so that you're basically speaking in the place of God to others. I remember the very first time I was supposed to... Uh, teach a uh, thing with the navigators and uh, you know it was a large group rally thing I'm like why'd they pick me <laughs> and uh, this gal who had been a oh, woman worker she was a little older gave me this verse that's you know whoever speaks speak as the oracles of God she's like no I didn't want that <laughs> I'm not supposed to say what God would say and then I realized well yeah I guess I am and the words that we speak to others in trying to help them grow should be what God's words are not speaking King James English, but God's truth. A verse to leave you with. Uh, I guess we're never going to get to volitional valuing. We'll start that next week. But uh, 1 Timothy 4, 6. Paul instructs Timothy and says, If you instruct the brethren in these things, go back and read the context, you will be a good servant of Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to give the characteristics of that good servant of Jesus Christ. You are nourished, strengthened, built up with the words of faith and of the good teaching which you have carefully followed. Okay, the easy one is it's obvious that Timothy was following the good teaching that he heard from Paul. He learned the truth, he lived the truth, and now he was supposed to love others with the truth. And in doing so, he would be a good servant of Jesus Christ. Because if you remember from Romans 12 last week, so the week before, uh, we're supposed to not be diligent in spirit, but serve others as we serve the Lord. The thing that's a little hard is what does it mean to be nourished in the words of faith? Notice it's words, not word. 
words that come out of the faith. It's not just that Jesus died for our sins. That would be singular. It's the plural thing, that he's coming back to judge, and you want to be able to do well at that judgment. So Timothy was supposed to build himself up with these things so he could then share it with others. And then verse 7, reject profane, common, old wives' tales, things that people talk about that really have no basis in truth. And I'm amazed at how quickly Satan tries to get most people off track on getting them involved in prophecy or Old Testament studies or, you know, just uh, things that are not the major meat of the scripture about denying yourself to live for godliness. And instead, reject that stuff. Don't get into those discussions. Train yourself for the purpose ice, of godliness. Train yourself for the purpose of godliness. Have you done that? What evidence do you have in your life that you have embarked on a training course to be useful for the master and equipped for every good work, which is what 2 Timothy 2.21 talks about? If you can't point to that, then you're just living for yourself. Why are you living? Why are you breathing? Why are you still on the planet? If it's not to accomplish God's purposes, particularly in the lives of others, why are you here? The answer would be to live for myself. Is that good? No, that's not good. Don't do that. <laughs> it, you end unhappily ever after. Um, so you need, you need to use the precious amount of time that God has given us during our time on this planet for the benefit of training ourselves so we can uh, serve others and we benefit long term from that. Verse 8, bodily exercise profits a little. But godliness is profitable in every situation. It has the promise of life now. You want the abundant life that Jesus came to give? How do you get it? Train yourself to be godly. You go to toil, I have a Christian career objectives, training objectives. Uh, they've been there. And you can uh, find, find them pretty easily. And it tells you things that you should have in your life so you can pass them on to others. I think there's like, a, maybe there are 30 there. I, mean, I can't remember. Uh, the exact number, but uh, it, it basically equips you with all the stuff you need to be able to be used by God in the lives of others. That just not only helps you have the promise of life that now is, but also gives you the promise of the life which is to come. Remember, there's uh, life, you're born again. There's abundant life, you are plugged into the Lord Jesus abiding in the vine. Then there's eternal life. It's dominion and good times in the kingdom. All these things Jesus came to give us, but if we're not looking to fulfill his purposes, if we're not godly, if we're not training ourselves to be godly, and we're not in the process of serving others, we're probably going to miss out on them. So I spent more time on this than I wanted, but um, any questions on it? Yeah? Well, Maybe, like, expect us, people that you have, they will respond a certain way, but they don't, they you get hurt. Yeah, that would be one good way. The, the rejection that you get because you're not doing God's purposes would possibly be hurt. The fact that you have a, a timetable that's not God's timetable, you know, causes damage as well. Um, the, the big thing is, you know, people will take shots at you whenever you try to help them. It's just like... A vet, I don't know how vets do it, but they've got a hurting wild animal, you know, almost wild animal on the table, and they go near the wild, you know, the, the part that hurts them, the animals will try to bite them, but somehow the vets know, you know, stay away from the point, pointy teeth, you know, keep away from that part. But like a veterinary dentist, uh, you know, it's like, <laughs> open wide, don't bite me, you know, I don't know how they do that, but uh, they'll frequently, you know, you, you can get hurt if you are not sensitive to what God's purposes are. And you'll go in with an objective that maybe God doesn't actually want to have happen, and then there's backlash from it. But do remember everything that happened to Paul and Jesus. You know, there was a, there was a lot of they, they a lot of flack, but because they had the sensitivity to God, God was able to strengthen and encourage them. Paul said, "You know, everybody deserted me. Nevertheless, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known." So, you know, remember you can't please everybody, but you can always please God. Bill, it sounds um, 
really hard. Oh yeah, too, too hard. Let's see. Yeah, I forget about it. Yeah, I, I was just kidding, guys. April Fools. No. <laughs> and, and to deny yourself and crucify and, and always live for uh, God and for others. Um, why would any rational being do this? <laughs> because the you live the better life now, the more satisfying life now. Jesus said. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone on the stalk. And winter comes and it's just there freezing. But if it dies, it goes to the ground. And while it's in the ground dying to itself, it gives rise to life for itself and others. And it's nice and warm in the ground during winter compared to what it does in the breeze. So it has promised, godliness has promised for life now as well as in the future. And as economic beings, it's like, I trade 10, 20, 30 years of this life for an eternity, because God is infinitely just, of good times. Like, that's why I would do it. So it's by far a better deal to take. Um, would you say that Satan has been extremely successful in kind of blinding people? To oh, that? totally. He has blinded the unbelieving. This is not unbelievers who don't know Christ. The context is he blinds the unbelieving to the light of the glory of the gospel. The glory of the gospel is that God gives glory to those who follow Christ. Not the forgiveness part. That's not in that context. Satan has blinded them. He holds up like people's jobs and says, oh, this is what you want. This will give you status and success and everything you want. Then, then why is it that anybody would leave this job? <laughs> you know, people have left it before because... Didn't pan out. Oh, the next one I get, that's going to do it. And people go through relationships the same way. Oh, the next one will do better. Yeah, it, it's not. So what, people, yeah. what was the verse you just mentioned? A grain of wheat fall to the ground and die? No, the one about the blinded people to the right. Oh, right Second right. Corinthians. Oh, where is that? Um, I'd look at five or eight. Uh, I know, just got out of this world blinded. She'll find it. She normally does real fast. <laughs> okay, uh, let me take. A I wrote some questions specifically for this. Let me just briefly go through them. And has anyone ever suggested to you that you're selfish or self-centered? If they have, you're selfish because it's really hard for people to actually say that. How do you go about changing? Uh, look at the sermon. Um, <laughs> um, for next week, I want you to think about what does God value, and you should be able to rattle off. Half a dozen things that God values. All right? And we're going to talk about those next week. Um, number three, if you denied your very life, why would you pursue your own self-centered agenda? Uh, kind of Fiona's question earlier, if you're pursuing your own self-centered agenda, you really have denied yourself. Uh, we'll talk a little more about unity and love next week. And the same questions on the bottom. Time's up, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have come to give us life, to give it to us abundantly. You are the Lord of life. And we recognize that the evil one always seeks to destroy and kill and prevent life from happening. Um, we know that your spirit that is within us is greater than that which is in the world, that your spirit will always be victorious, um, that your Holy Spirit can put to death um, not just the schemes of Satan, but also the desires that uh, would help us uh, or prevent us from living for you. I pray that you would guide us in following our Lord Jesus in denying ourselves. I pray that you would help us in crucifying ourselves, that as we yield ourselves to you, you would take things that we give you and kill them. And uh, that we would be free of them. The truth would make us free and we'd be free indeed. I pray that we know the glorious liberty of the children of God uh, because of the work your Spirit is doing in our lives. May we be receptive and responsive and then may we share it with others so that more may know you, experience you, and glorify you. We commit ourselves to that task during our time here on earth. Thanks for our food. We pray a blessed afternoon in Christ's name. Amen.